spirituality transcends all apparent identities. I want to say I have seen some amazing things today at your ashram. I've seen children doing things that science cannot explain. And it's really touched my heart. And seeing those kids here singing was also like brought tears to my eyes. So last night, I spoke to members of Gurudev staff, and I asked them, what is the type of energy that they would want us to create in this room? So I want to tell you the three words that they gave me, and I want all of us to just set an intention that this is the energy that we experience over the next hour or so. So the first word is reverence. Reverence meaning a combination of respect and love for every being in this room, and of course, the being on stage. The second word they gave me is magic. They said, do not discuss things that we have already been discussing in the conference. Make it unusual. They pointed out that the name of this event is the unknown factor, so they told me to ask you questions about the unknown, difficult questions. <laughs> They want me to put you on the spot. So we will start with, with something really interesting. And the third is magic. They want magic, magic and was wonder. The second, magic yeah. was the second. The third is wonder. They want to expand the minds of people, everyone here, to think beyond how we have been trained to think about life and the world. What is in the great beyond? So are we ready? Yes. So I want to just ask everybody to close your eyes and we're just going to set an intention to fill the energy of this space with reverence, magic, and wonder. Reverence, magic, wonder. And now we begin. So we're going to start with a really easy question. Okay, just a warm-up, kindergarten-level question that you would ask a guru. So. What is enlightenment? This was an actual question your team told me to ask you. When a blind person asks what is light, or a deaf person asks what is sound, how can you describe that? So let's, let's, let, let's go to something else then. <laughs> Better we go to something else. Because I'm not sure if that would pass the exam. <laughs> but they are millions of people in the world, right? Millions of people in any given area. And there's one or two that maybe might reach enlightenment. You, obviously, was someone who had that gift. But what was it that made it different? Were you born with it or was it a journey you sought to go on? I didn't do anything. I didn't seek for anything. I've been like this from the very beginning. What were you like as a baby? As I am now, I'm still, I feel I'm still a baby. <laughs> So, as someone, were you going to say See, something? the nature of mind, just observe the nature of mind. If you are given ten compliments and one insult, what does it hang on to? More often on the negative side than the positive. But as a child, what were you doing? How was your state of mind? You lived in the present moment. You were crying for something, the tears were still on your cheek and you started smiling. As an adult, when you cry for you to smile back again, it takes some time. But not for a child, because the mind is in the present moment, number one. Second, there is depth which is unfathomable. 
because our consciousness is so vast and so deep and it is the home of all knowledge and it is compassion you are a bubbling fountain of compassion you are a source of love and when we forget this that's when we think we are not enlightened enlightenment is something that is in your true nature but it is just being overshadowed or veiled by small things you know veiled by desires and uh, obsessions and likes and dislikes if you can open that curtain and look from it from or beyond it then you see you know the there's one universal force or energy that's what you are and you're suggesting that that universal force of energy is ultimately love it is love not ultimately in the very beginning it is love how can we how can we practice more love how can we feel that energy within us more towards other people and to ourselves no tell me why do you have to feel it because it feels good why should you feel good all the time that's a good question yeah <laughs> our thing is we are obsessed with all the time all the time being happy i want all this to be successful i want to achieve so what just wake up and see you know you will drop all these hooks that you are hanging on to and suddenly you find yourself so free so when i was talking to one of the i was talking to a young man here who is 35 years old and at the age of 25 he moved here to the ashram and i said what made you do that what made you move here and spend a decade here what was it about shri shri that inspired you to do so he said when he observed you no matter who you were talking to even if it was a 30 second interaction you would display this sense of love and compassion how can all of us remember to do that you know uh, this is something that you cannot force on yourself number one no emotion no feelings can be created or forced upon if you do it it will be artificial what you need is to work on yourself clarity in mind purity in heart how would that come when you have very little needs you have clarity you your list of needs if it grows on and on and on you will be less and less loving and less and less compassionate but you need very little or you don't need anything for yourself then you will see your compassion your love your feelings are positive and they're already there you don't need to do something see when a lit candle doesn't need to do something to push its light all the way throughout the fact that it is lit is good enough the rays are anyway going out so that opens up a very interesting idea one of the topics of this conference is dispassion the ability to let go and if you look at what is common in american spiritual growth literature right now there's this idea of surrender not thriving striving to goals but surrender into the unknown could you talk about this act of surrendering every day or every night when you hit the pillow in the night what do you do you simply let go let the sleep take over you breathe in how long can you hold that sometime you have to let go so while passion is like breathing in this passion is like breathing out we have to let go 
you know. Unless you have dispassion, passion will turn into depression. And today, if something is happening in the world as depression or aggression, see, our society is clogged with two uh, major issues today. On one hand, there is aggression. People are very aggressive. You see around the world, there are demonstration and um, mindless violence. On the other side, depression. 40% of the population in Europe are depressed. In this country, 40% of uh, students in Mumbai are depressed. So the depression is a result of not having or not knowing how to let go. See, dispassion may appear to be a very big, quote unquote, big word and very uh, philosophical thing. Oh, well, I had to be dispassionate. Means maybe I had to put on a lot of ashes and go to Himalayas. Where Rudraksha, no. It's an inherent quality in human life to let go. You have heard something, you have seen something, if you don't let go of it, you know what that state is called? Trauma. Traumas are those experiences that your mind catches on and is unable to let go. So in, in some sense, we're all traumatized. <laughs> if you're traumatized, you can never feel passion or dispassion or passion or compassion or love. All these qualities which you crave for, you yourself are putting a block to it. So seeing life from a bigger context, at the end of the day, the curtain is going to fall and the show will be finished. We must be aware of this. You know, just now, someone asked me there about uh, midlife crisis. I said midlife crisis is the intermission, intermission of the movie. It's the interval. What do you call intermission? No? Intermission. Intermission of the movie. So all the thrill is only later on. You know, the success of a movie is determined after the intermission only. So I told them, look, you are in the intermission. So what comes from now on is going to determine whether you are a tragic or a comedy or what type of movie your life is. I was mentioning, uh, uh, was a saint in this country he was just a government servant. After his retirement, he went to his guru. And at the age of 78 or so, 76 or 78, his master told him, I want you to take the message of Lord Krishna to the world. And someone gave him $30. And with those $30, he boarded a ship. He didn't have money to fly to New York. He went to New York with $30 in his hand on a ship. You know what did he do? What? The ISKCON movement started by that. Wow. Do you know the ISKCON movement? Which is known world over, Hare Krishna movement. Uh -huh. It started by a man who was 78 year old. From Calcutta, he sailed all the way to New York and stayed in somebody's basement at that age. So, Passion and dispassion, when they don't go together, we end up having depression, anxiety, tension, and all these ills that we see on the, the society. So let's look at the people in this room. From what I've come to understand, the people in this room, primarily women, are, among, at, a, are at a very high level of the service you do in the world, the work they do in the world, the projects that they handle. How do we balance that? 
because there are so many good people who want to do things. They want to create products. They want to fix the world. That's the passion. But it's easy to hear this passion. But what does that look like in our lives? How do we create that intricate balance? Well, you want to do all that, yes. At the same time, remember, your life, your energy is limited. If you don't have this context that my life and my li uh, energy is limited, then you will lose the, uh, the, uh, the sight of your own plan. You will you'll get lost in the work, number one. Second is, alone you cannot do. You have to gather everybody. You have to do with everybody. So when you have this attention that we all have together have to do this, that very sense will relax you and give you that uh, attitude of friendliness to, towards and compassion towards everybody. Let's go on that topic. Friendliness and compassion towards everyone. I met another person here at the ashram and I asked him, what did you find fascinating about Gurudev and he said I would really admire Gurudev for the prison project and he said Gurudev said a quote to me and it took me a long time to understand the quote but the quote was this and it has to do with passion towards everyone the quote was inside every perpetrator is a victim waiting to be loved let's talk about that for a moment on the soft topic of compassion to others how do we develop that, especially when other people can be wrong to us? You know, just broaden your vision. You see someone as a culprit. Don't go by their words. Don't go by their action, but see beyond their words and action, the state of their mind. Why would someone commit a crime if he's not hurt if there is no anger or frustration inside of that person. You know, like a doctor, a psychologist, you know, you take a patient to a psychologist, what do they do? They don't just look, uh, uh, on, they, they don't just swim on the surface. They go deep into their psyche and say, oh no, this person has personality disorder. And so they don't worry about what they're talking about. So you go to the root cause of any crime, you will find that beautiful being there is being uh, hurt or is suffering, is sick and they need some treatment. So that's easy to see when it's say a criminal. But what if it's something annoying that your spouse does? Well, I have no experience on that. <laughs> I cannot comment. That was a trick question, Guruji. <laughs> but I would say, don't expect a rosy, rosy day all through your uh, uh, life. Thorny days do come. Accept that. And differences of opinions do come. Accept that. My way is highway can never happen in a marriage. I suppose. <laughs> but there, I would say, if you take your turn to be upset, <laughs> not at the same time. I like that. So, since it is Valentine's Day today, I'm curious, because this is probably one of the deepest mysteries, other than reincarnation and intuition and all the other things that we could talk about one of the deepest mysteries is just what would be your advice to two people who want to make a relationship really truly wonderful work and be in a beautiful state you know you must uh, i would give you an analogy of two parallel lines if two lines are moving parallelly they go for infinity but if they're focused on each other, they will cross and they'll go far away from each other. 
same way in any relationship if you want that to uh, to stay forever you should have a common goal and not focus on each other or police on each other if your focus is only on each other you know one day you will be honey and next day you will be bitter <laughs> you see so but uh, with an understanding with the common goal for each each of you you move on and then you will see that uh, you will be able to accomplish things better and the relationship is sustained in in the past century i would say in the past century or even in this century earlier this century parents had one goal of their children the children were their goal so both of them will put their 100% to make the family work so they would though they may complain against each other but the family remained intact because uh, they and then they, they loved each other very much even though those who fight don't think they don't they don't love each other they have lot of love but just the focus is uh, misplaced it's too self centric or it centered on each other instead of saying what i can how i can contribute in this relationship one keeps thinking what i can get out of this that's where uh, we get into trouble i love that response wasn't that one of the most beautiful analogies of a really good relationship <laughs> so gurudev i want to go now into the unknown I want to ask you about some of the mysteries that I've seen over here. I think whatever we spoke is somewhat unknown, isn't it? Let's go <laughs> deeper into the unknown. Okay. <laughs> so today I observe some young children here who were, who had seemingly mystical abilities. I observe children who with their eyes closed were able to read things I wrote on a piece of paper and duplicate it. using intuition what is going on there <laughs> and how can i get my kids to do that <laughs> it's easy you know we have a uh, workshop for that you know kids see because kids mind i would if you ask me why only kids why not adults why not we all can do it i'm very concerned about the casinos in the world so see that's on a lighter way so why why adults cannot have it because our mind is uh clogged i would say with uh, cravings and aversions open we are so opinionated all, all this opinionated mind cannot see things fresh cannot access to the intuitive ability that our spirit has you know it's uh, it's the spirit or the energy in us that that can show us many other dimensions see our conscious that is research uh, is going on on this by several uh, institutions including our own institution and how this is possible it's not some voodoo thing it's a science that children are able to access to another uh part of our brain which we normally don't use it see so you get dreams in intuitive dreams you have all experience of all the senses when you are sleeping in dream you are walking in dream you are singing you are eating you are experiencing everything how is that possible because the consciousness is that which experiences everything whether in the waking dreaming or sleeping and it can experience something deeper in another dimension which is unknown i would say the fourth dimension so and meditation is the way to access to that So this fourth dimension, this unknown. If we became really good friends, would you be able to go there and help me with my stock portfolio? 
yeah, I would say no, cannot, we can, everyone can experience it. Today we have more than 80,000 children who can do this. Right. This is going to revolutionize education for the coming generation. Amazing. In addition to what I observed today, children being able to tap into intuition, and this has been a field that has fascinated me for a long time. For five years, I was a meditation teacher, teaching intuition meditation around the world. So this really touched my heart. But I've never seen this level of ability. But I also observed today, I witnessed a girl able to move objects with her mind. Let's talk about that. I'm curious to know how you are, what, what is happening in that ability? You know, in the beginning you said we had to wonder, right? Wondering is only wondering. You cannot, wonder cannot turn into questions. <laughs> Certain things we need to wonder about, you know, and they don't have answers, right? The world has many wonders. We fail to recognize them. We fail to enjoy them. Uh, we try to understand everything through our intellect, and so we get stuck. And sometimes some incidences like this shock us and take us beyond our logical, uh, rational mind. Now, you know your logic is limited. Why? Because your knowledge is limited. Nobody can claim to have all knowledge in the, on the, in the universe. You know only this much, right? Your knowledge is limited. Your logic is connected to what you already know. So, from what you know, you try to move into the unknown, what you don't know. And it is not possible all, always through logic. Because logic is within the circle of knowing. That's beautifully said. Now, I want to I wanna ask a question because this genuinely puzzles me. If you, because I come from American spirituality, that's where I spent a good deal of my life. And when you think of American spirituality, you think about books like The Secret, movies like The Secret, the idea that your thoughts create your reality. Now, let's say that's true. Your thoughts create your reality. I've never seen it as demonstrated as I saw today with a little girl moving objects on a table. But you also spoke about surrender. What is the balance there? How, how much should we be focused on the goal or the outcome that we want? How much should we be surrendering? How do we unify the two? Now, let me make one correction here. There is nothing called American spirituality, <laughs> European spirituality, Indian spirituality. It's like, it's like saying, I have an Indian breath or a Chinese breath. <laughs> breath is breath. So it transcends nationality, transcends gender, spirituality. Uh, sorry to say that. Spirituality transcends all apparent identities. All apparent identities. And this is true. So, in, you see, 40 years back, spirituality was a taboo. Meditation was a taboo. Nobody in the mainstream would meditate. If you are meditating, you think they think you are somewhere, you know, out there. You are considered not normal if you think you are doing yoga or meditation. I'm talking about 40 years back when I was traveling different parts of the world. Vegetarianism was mocked at. 
If you say, I am only vegetarian, people would look up and down. Something wrong with you. How are you sustaining yourself? So when I would walk like this in the snow in Alps uh, in Switzerland or in Norway, people would wonder whether this is an alien or is a human being. <laughs> so why I'm saying this is world is changing. Today meditation is so popular. Two billion people around the globe are practicing yoga. Two billion. And it's become even a fashion to meditate and to practice yoga. This was not the case 40 years back. So our paradigms are changing, our parameters are changing, our understanding of the world, understanding of ourselves is changing. So in this scenario, you will see the coming generation uh, would, would take to meditation, spirituality like fish to water. And this is, well, from meditation, they, another term came out, mindfulness. A new making, new, new, new format of it. I would say medita mindfulness is just the driveway. It's not real meditation. It's a driveway. No doubt it's, it's like the portico or the balcony of a house. But there is so much more beyond uh, mindfulness. And if you practice mindfulness too much, you know, you, you lose the ability to relax and to be with the unknown. And that is not also so good. So, spirituality is authentic in the sense when it is uh, also authenticated, verified by thousands of year old uh, uh, documents about it. Scriptural evidences are there and there are ways to find out whether your experience is just a hallucination or you are making it up or it's a mood making or it's a real experience. And that's where I would say um, you need an authentic uh, meditation techniques or spirituality, which is based, rooted in uh, thousands of years of documentations. So I want to come to that. I want to understand how you define meditation, because what you s just said, mindfulness simply being the balcony of a house, is very intriguing. It's controversial, because in some places, mindfulness is it. That's what the scientists are talking about. That's what the doctors are talking about. We'll come back to that, but I don't want to let you off the hook yet. I still want to understand this concept of your thoughts, to your thoughts focused on what you want versus surrender. Yeah, I'll come to that. Yeah, surrender. Now, this word surrender has been used and misused too many times, so I don't like to use that word actually because it gives a wrong connotation. Why do you have to surrender anything? Who is surrendering? You know? Why to, why to bother? Why bother to surrender? It's an act you are doing, you are surrendering something. Just wake up and see, there is nothing. You know? When you, this is, a, I would say, this is a path of knowledge. When the knowledge, the path of knowledge, when you wake up and say, there is nothing yours. Not even this body is yours. Why are you there to surrender? Yes. For those who are not uh, so sharp in their intellect or uh, not in the path of knowledge, who are simple emotional people, and they're buried uh, with their own emotions, negativity. For them it is said, okay, what are you feeling? Anxiety, you surrender it. You're feeling anger, surrender it. You are upset, surrender that. So for them it works, for simple tons, for simple people who cannot see the grand picture that you are nothing, 
when you feel you are nothing, you are already surrendered. But when you cannot feel that you are nothing, you feel you are something, you are holding on to something. Hey, come on, let go. Surrender is simply letting go. It is to feel mother is at home. Say, suppose a child is very upset, and say, no, no, mommy is here in the room. You know? So the child relaxes. Just to make you feel relaxed, just to give you that confidence, all is happening as per plan. A word is used, surrender. Let go. So I feel uh, you can simply say, Nobody will ask you to surrender any of the positive qualities you have. Will anyone say, surrender your compassion, surrender your love, surrender your generosity? No. What they will ask you to surrender? What is asked of you to be surrendering it? Your anxiety? Your tension? Only that negative things which you cannot manage yourself, manage by yourself, and it's an illusion in your mind and you are carrying it and being burdened and feeling sad and morose about it, then the master said, hey, let go of it, surrender it. And if you cannot let go of negative things, then it's a problem. Either through knowledge you know there is nothing negative, nothing positive. Then nothing bothers you. Or through emotion, through devotion, you say, there is someone to take care of me, I'm going to let go of this. My weaknesses. You said it, there's someone to take care of me, I'm going to let go of this. That was an important insight. I want to go back to something you said. You said meditation is the house, mindfulness is just a balcony. Too much mindfulness takes you away from, away from the unknown. Can you go deeper on that topic? What is meditation to you? Meditation is that experience uh, where I can say, what are the conditions for meditation? There are three important conditions if you want to meditate. There are golden principles. The first one is for next 10 minutes, I want nothing. You, I don't, I'm not expecting you to say, I want nothing in my life. Okay, you want many things? Keep it aside. For next 10 minutes, I want nothing. Not even a glass of water, I'm okay. So 10 minutes, I want nothing. And then, next 10 minutes, can you just be doing nothing? If you say yes. I'm not going to be mindful if the mind drifts somewhere. Let it drift. I want nothing, I do nothing. And the third one is, I am nothing. You have to let go of all the labels you put on yourself, including, I am a teacher, I am, I'm a, I'm a guru, or I am an industrialist, I am man, I am woman, or I am this, I am scholar. All these labels that you put on yourself, you have to let go and say, I am nothing. I want nothing, I do nothing, I am nothing. These three basic principles let your mind free from the outer uh, stimuli which it has been engaging day in and out to dive into its own source, its own uh, you know, the mind goes to its source. Then it becomes no mind. Then you feel, um, I, I'm not supposed to say what you feel. Whatever you feel, it's okay. I love that. I am nothing. I want nothing. I do nothing. What is the ultimate game plan for you? Where would you like to see humanity going? As a species, what is that future world? In other words, if you, Gurudev, could flash forward to the world 
100 years from now, what would be that ideal vision you would like to see? You know what? There is a bigger intelligence which is managing the whole world. And it knows what to bring, when to bring, how to do, and it's doing, it's doing its job perfect. And I have nothing to give, not to advise that big intelligence. <laughs> you know, often we keep, uh, either you say big intelligence or God, we, we want to advise God. <laughs> We give ideas and advice as though we know better than God. But while you say that, you also are a big activist. You brought peace to Colombia after 50 years. You spoke up when Australia was culling. No, you are talking about 100 years from now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you ask me, do you have a role to play now here? And do everyone has a role to play in the world? Or just say, Oh, inshallah, God is taking care of everything. I would say, yeah, we have a role to play. And the same intelligence is telling us to do uh, things when we have to do, we, will continue, we should continue to do. We have to hear, listen to our own inner voice. God is not sitting or hanging in the clouds or beyond the clouds somewhere there. NASA has gone beyond the clouds, they couldn't find there. That God is inside of us and everywhere where he is not. That intelligence, we are floating in an ocean of intelligence. The moment we become quiet, then we have more access to this intelligence. Not just intelligence, at that time we also become spontaneous. See, when the values are imbibed in you, you don't think in your mind, oh, one lady has fallen, I had to go and lift her up. You're walking in the street, if a lady falls up, falls down, an elderly lady, you simply jump to help them to come up. Because these are all ingrained in you. The goodness is ingrained in you. You don't have to cultivate it. All that you need to do is get rid of negativity. And the negativity is because of lack of energy. See, the Monday morning you are very fresh. The way you react is much different than how you react on the Friday morning. Because by Friday you are so worn out. So when, you are, when we are stressed, when we are tensed, even wanting to be mindful, it can throw us off the balance. It's, it can make us or give us an illusion we are disconnected from the ocean of intelligence and energy. Actually, we can never be disconnected. You can never be disconnected from the infinity, from the unknown. But it gives you an illusion you are separate. You are disconnected. And that's where Letting go will help. Thank you. And on that beautiful closing words, we want to open up questions to the audience. Do we have mic runners ready? So I'm going to let the people with the mic choose. And if you have a question, raise your hand. Dear Gurudev, could you talk about artificial intelligence? Pardon? Artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence. It's a phenomenon. This shows that intelligence is not only in human beings in the brain, it can be, it is in the space. And, and from space, you are downloading it. Intelligence is in every part, particle of this creation. There is intelligence, that's how the, the flowers are, the way they are. A seed grows because of intelligence. Animals build their nests 
their, you know, birds build their nests because of intelligence. We don't call this uh, artificial intelligence. We call this natural intelligence. But when you do it through a um, computer, you call it artificial. But that is also a game. It's a mathematics. You have programmed it, and it is working. There are, it's just because there are several movies now with the idea that you can substitute humans with robots and make them feel, which is impossible if we are love and God and they are machines. Thank you, but I just want to keep it to one question per person, so as many yeah. people as possible get a chance yeah. to ask. Dear Purdue, you mentioned that we should look past people who have um, hazardous emotional states and try to see that if they're acting in a wrong way or if they're in a bad mental state, that it's just their current emotional state. Could you, would you like to come to the front no, no, so we can okay. see? I can't see you. <laughs> <laughs> can you repeat the question? Yes, I was just mentioning that you had mentioned that we should look past people who are in a troubled emotional state and try to understand that they're in their current mental state is, is fragile. But what if those people refuse to take help or even refuse to see that they are in that state. Isn't it so easy to just see them as criminals or other bad things? If you are a mother, you would understand this or you would have, may, you may not have even asked this question because you know your child sometimes refuses to take medicine. But you somehow force it on the child or cajole the kid, do something, show, show the kid something, this and that, and then slowly give the medication. You have all the skills to do. Same way, you know, you should, when people are not normal, or they're behaving like this, you should know you are much bigger than them. You should treat them like kids, like ignorant. I would say them three ways. People are either ignorant, or they are sick, I think the two is enough. Are they immature? They don't have intellectual ability to rise up. So in all these three conditions, if you are disturbed by that, it's not going to help in any way, neither you or them. So you have to take the stand uh, of a big mother, I would say, in order to handle any such situation. Thank you. Let's have another question. Yes, uh, thank you. My name is Rosalia Arteaga, and I came from Ecuador, Latin America. I am former president of my country. I worked all my life in education. I know for sure that you are working on education too, but I am curious about what do you think is the uh, most important role of education in this globalized world? Education, which, should, uh, which is, see, today with the technology, information is spreading very fast. So education is not just stuffing information into the child. It is developing their personality. It is developing their ability to take criticism to be able to give honest feedbacks and criticism, their self-confidence, and the ability to connect with people from all over the world. You know, it's easy to connect to few people of their own generation, that everybody does. But there are some kids who can connect to people of any generation, of any nationality, any religion, be seeing beyond prejudice. What would be necessary in the coming uh, education system is a prejudice-free mind or intellect that we need to develop. Beautiful. Uh, I like that. I have a question. Uh, uh, you have mentioned about human intelligence as well as artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence and human intelligence, they are bi-directional arrows. 
uh, we depend upon human intelligence to incorporate any activities. Our major problem in the society, as your honor have already mentioned, stress and emotion. Uh, we are trying to solve that, applying artificial intelligence. But how do you visualize that future will be towards the society? Putting its I, impact. I don't see any danger to the society because of artificial intelligence, number one. You know, the term artificial intelligence has just come. But for me, it has come with the calculator. Yes. When we were young, we had to calculate all the numbers, use our brain, and today nobody uses... <laughs> nobody puts so much effort, not use their brain, I don't mean to say. No, people take that little plastic box and then press all the numbers and say, you know. So the calculator, multiplication, division, um, all plus, minus, everything is done by calculator, but before calculator came, maybe yes. you may be also of that generation. Yeah, yes. When we were in the schools, we have not heard about calculators. Yes. Only in my high schools, then we saw remotely the calculators. Before that, we had to mug multiplication tables. So, from that angle, artificial intelligence has already begun with the calculator. Yes. And it has not uh, taken away human work or resource or anything. It has only added. added. So I am all confident that's not going to bring a disaster to society. Thank you. Thank you. Good day. There is always a backlash against any new technology. Even Socrates once complained that writing would cause the Greeks to lose the ability to be intellectual. Good evening, oh. gentlemen. My name is Jacinta. I'm a student uh, from St. Andrew's College in Bandra. My question is that you just mentioned three elements to improve meditation. Once we do improve meditation, does that help us get closer to tapping the unknown, or does that help us expand our logic, or both? Yes. <clears throat> Vision, happy Valentine's Day. I dressed up for you. Thank you. Thank you. Same to you. Meditation, what meditation does? Let me say it in, a sh in short. Meditation, first of all, improves our energy field. You know, we are all mass of energy. We radiate energy. We radiate positive energy, we radiate negative energy. When we feel negative, that's what goes out of it. Meditation harnesses our energy level, number one. Second is it makes our mind uh, very sharp, intellect very sharp, mind very clear, our emotions soft and strong. Either our emotions are very strong or they are very delicate, but meditation brings that balance between sensitivity and sensibility. And then it improves your intuitive ability and it opens the door for unknown that your uh, intelligence or intuitive ability is way beyond your expectation. Thank you. That does answer my question. Thank you. And the three steps again were, I think nothing, I do nothing, I am nothing. Correct. I want to get that on a t-shirt. <laughs> could, I, could I sell that? Could I get the <laughs> trademark? I'm kidding. But that's beautifully said. I, I really love that explanation. It's one of the most elegant explanations I've heard for meditation. Next question. Yeah. Uh, Jai Gurudev. Uh, first of all, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, first time that I'm attending. It's a wonderful experience. Uh, the question I have is, uh, one, my background is I work in the corporate life, so very hectic uh, as I feel. It may not be for everybody. Uh, in the path of spirituality, uh, how much importance the spiritual, uh, the rituals of puja, lighting a lamp in the morning and the evening have as compared to doing yoga and meditation? So if I have, I'm struggling with one, one and a half hours of time in the morning, 
and I want to grow spirituality. What should take precedence? <laughs> Lighting the lamp in front of the God, uh, decorating my God, and then sitting into meditation, or it's yoga and meditation. So, so first let's just define puja for the, the non-Hindi speakers here. Uh, yeah, so in Indian rituals, uh, daily we have this uh, uh, ritual or the activity of lighting lamp in front of the statue you follow or the, the God you follow. So it's a, a practice, yeah, a, a prayer. Yeah. Some rituals. Yeah, yeah I, some rituals. I get it. Too, yeah. You know the word puja comes from that which is born of fullness. So when you feel so grateful for the nature, what it has given to you, you simply remember that. So puja is a small ceremony in which you thank God for giving you fruits, flowers, and rice, and light, and fragrance, all that five senses uh, enjoy or rejoice in this material world. You know, you see flowers, and uh, you smell them, and so you use all these nice things, and then finally you take a piece of camphor or a light, and go around the deity saying, let the life let the light of my life always circle around you, not go away from you. So with this intention, they do a little ceremony. And there are many ancient ceremony on puja for many things. We use havan, fire sacrifice ceremony with 108 different herbs and all this. I, I would suggest you few minutes of asana, 10 minutes of asana, five, seven minutes of pranayama, meditation is most important. Meditation is supreme. A little bit of ritual is to create a nice environment. You know, you light a lamp at home. It's like, uh, you know, in the West also, at Christmas, you decorate your Christmas tree. You bring a Christmas tree and you decorate that. If it's Easter, you do something. A little ceremony that doesn't mean much to you. I mean, it's not going to bring you the grace of God or elevate you to a higher level. But that little ceremony creates a celebrative atmosphere. It creates a positive atmosphere. In this sense, I would say you can have a little bit of ritual is, is always good, not too much ritual. A little bit ritual every day can create that positive uh, energy. And meditation is the real thing, uh, essence of all, of all the rituals. Uh, rituals are preparation to go deep in meditation. And now, on that note, we're going to take one final question. And then, Gurudev, I'd like to ask if you would lead us in a meditation. Would you guys like to experience that? Okay, so our last question. Uh, Jay Gurdi, uh, Gurdi, I am Dr. Ritu Dehradun. I have been blessing for my son's selection in the medical. Mein. He is doing MBBS. But uh, Gurdi, in our and in the past, the habits that we have changed in our children, we can't control ourselves to see ourselves. How do we handle anger? Ko kaise handle karein, bachcho ko kaise spirituality ke pathway pe motivate karein. He did advance also, but not doing meditation daily. ये जो प्रश्न का उत्तर मैं नहीं दूंगा, ये प्रश्न आपके साथ रहने दूंगा। क्यों? इसी प्रश्न के वजह से आपको कई विचारें आ सकती हैं, और उन सब को लागू करके देखो। बच्चों को कैसे लेके आना एक लाइन पे? वो जो है? उसके लिए एक आइडिया एक आइडिया से नहीं चल सकता है मल्टीपल आइडिया समय लगानी पड़े सो so, वो आप प्रयत्न करिए एक माँ का दिल तो धड़कता है जब बच्चे गलत रास्ते पे जाते हैं ये स्वाभाविक है होना भी चाहिए आपको एक बच्चे का फिकर है मुझे पूरे देश के सब बच्चों का फिकर इसीलिए सब करते रहते हैं I will say that in English also a little bit. Uh, she said she's uh, bothered about how her children are going into bad habits. And I said, uh, 
mothers will have to have this botheration. But you know, you have to, I, I said that uh, you, be, you be bothered about all the kids, not just your own child. I am bothered about all the children in this planet who are going into wrong ways. And what to do, how to bring them back to right path is a question which does not have one single answer. I won't take away this question from you, I'll keep it with you. You can think about it. Time to time you may get different ideas and put them all into uh, action and see which works. Something will work. So some questions, they bring about more answers time to time. So we, can, we should not seal them with one answer. So thank you, Guru Dev. That was a beautiful experience. Wonderful. Would you have any closing words for our participants today? I will leave it that to you. <laughs> thank you he's so going much. To, he's going to hear the closing words. I want you to simply make a note of what you learned today. For everyone, there may have been a different word of wisdom that may have touched you in a different way. And perhaps when you go out and you have your dinner, and thank you for being patient, I know we were slightly behind schedule, you might take the opportunity to converse with another person over here and share your point of wisdom with their point of wisdom so that you guys can help each other better reflect on and digest some of the, the wise words that Guru Dev sh shared. And thank you so much. I have so much to think about on the flight back home tonight. And it was wonderful having you guide us on a meditation. Please, big round of applause for Guru Dave. I will.